Hi, this is Roger Braslett. And this is Timothy Stone. We are at Bush Gardens listening to Daniel run the Griffin. And you're stuck listening to Gaming and BS. Welcome to Gaming and BS, sponsored by Gamehole Con. A gaming convention coming to Madison, Wisconsin in November. Get your ass to Gamehole Con. Visit GameholeCon.com for more information. Welcome to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome, folks. Welcome back. And for new listeners, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on board. Epi- episode 97. Yeah, closing down on 100. It's getting there. It's getting there. Tick, 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 tick. All right. <laughs> Cool. Should we just get right into this stuff here? Yes. So what have you got here, man? Well, first off, I got to start. We got to start with this one is congratulations to Chris Nizak from Misdirected Mark. <laughs> he, Phil Vecchione, and uh, Bob Everson, and a few other folks headed down to Mexico. And Mr. Snezak is a newly wedded man. Congratulations, Chris, to you and the lovely missus. I hope things continue to go as blissful as they are. Awesome. Congratulations, man. Really, really cool. Happy for you. Yes. And, and if uh, if you are not following Misdirected Mark on Google+, Plus, you should go out there because uh, I think uh, one of the ladies from uh, She's a Super Geek did a cute little uh, boy band tribute for uh, Chris Sneezak out there, a little fun exercise. So get out there and take a look at that. That's I fun. think it would have been better if they were just wearing skimpy bathing suits on the beach. and no then sh- Speedos and no shirts? Speedos and no shirts. And then you take the big text that she put across them just to cover up the Speedos. Oh, a little racier. Yeah. That, that's the inside of the cover. The outside is what she's got out there. The Touché. inside, when you buy it, it's like the old Prince covers, right? You flip it open like, ooh. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we would get. Yeah, yeah. I'd that's buy the inside that. cover. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. Shit, buy that, put that on my wall. Goddamn. R- right. Blow it up, dude. <laughs> I'll get fired from work having that in my cube. That's what'll happen. <laughs> NSFW. <laughs> anyway, the other piece we have, of course, as I alluded to and we have been talking about, is GamingNBS.com forward slash Trivia 100 is wrapping up pretty soon, as noted by the fact that this is episode 97. So get out there, submit your info. doesn't take long. It's 13 questions. And we got some cool goodies, some swag we're going to pass out. So get out there, do it. There's uh, really nothing to lose. Do it! So, excellent. Shia. Sean? Yeah, yeah, Shia LaBeouf is telling you what to do. Uh, 15 games we have. Under our banner? Here. Under our banner. Nice. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, too late to... It's too late to register an event to run under Gamhole. That, the Gamhole banner. So Jimmy, Roger, Nick, Tim, Derek, and Forrest. Gracias, muchos. Yes, absolutely. We've got some, the event list is out. It's in the wild. Uh, Game Hole has posted it. So there are Gaming NBS banner stuff out there. Dead Game Society is going to be doing some cool stuff. My buddy Lenny's poking around, already got a wish list going. So yeah, there's some, there's some cool looking games coming. So it'll be a lot of fun. So there's oh, speaking, of- speaking of, speaking of cool games, I got to throw this out there. My buddy Lenny has an idea of this. Kind of a LARPy zombie huntery thing that might happen at Evercon this year. I'm really, really hoping that works. Is he so, doing it? Yeah, I think he's gonna set it up. I'm not. I don't have the full details yet, but from uh, the Cliff's Notes version I got was pretty fucking cool. So we'll see. Once I know more about it, I will broadcast the details. Right. Should be good. So you can go to GameholeCon.com and you can when you register, you can actually put your wish list together, and then when it comes to checking out your events. I mean, literally it's like a push of a button. And I think as long as everything is in order, you boom, you're registered for all the events that are in your wish list. Bam. Yep. Bam, boom, bam. Yes, yes, yes. Should be good. Yeah. Let's get to random Random encounter. encounter. Random encounter segment of the show where we field emails, voicemails, comments from social media. You want me to go? You want to go? You do this one. It's Angela. Angela, it you 
Uh, you shall read hers. I will read the next one. Angela. Hey, guys. Very excited to hear Brett will be at Queen's, Queen City Conquest. I'm hoping someone... See, Sean, I told you people liked me. I told you somebody somewhere liked me. Uh, yeah. I was saying, somebody does. Besides it... my mom, somebody else likes me. So that's helpful. <laughs> Sorry, that's all I got. It's been a long weekend. Anyway, carry on, Sean. Brett. <laughs> You feel better about yourself, dude. A, l- a little bit. It's just, it's been a, it's been, it is totally. Been. Anyway, yeah. carry on. I will shut up. I'm hoping someone can convince Sean to come too. Hey. At the very least, I want to hang out and listen to you guys banter with the misdirected Mark guys and all the other cool folks that will be there. So, PC backgrounds. Much of my GM philosophy is founded on not making the mistakes I've seen other GMs make. Ignoring PC backgrounds is one of my major pet peeves. I don't think I would make Angela very happy. (laughs) No, she'd she'd stab you, but I mean, you'd learn from that, so that's good. That's true. It's a learning experience. Think of of all the scars you would get from this as uh, experience. That's what it would be. And maybe that's why I still really don't adhere to a lot of character backgrounds because I haven't had any of my players stab me. I, uh, Kevin and I were talking about this. Anyway, we, we got this covered. Carry thank on. God we, well, thank God we play virtually. <laughs> Back in the 90s, a friend wanted to start up a GURPS game where the PCs were psychic kids on the run from a secret government agency. Hmm. Escape from which mountain, maybe? Perhaps. I like it. I don't remember what my PC's psychic powers were, but I do remember that she was a bike messenger who didn't know her birth parents were, had grown up bouncing between foster homes, and had recently lost her best friend and confidant to mysterious circumstances. Based on the background for the game the GM had given me, I tried to create a character. I tried to create a character I'd enjoy playing, but also give plenty of plot hooks in her background. Looking back, a little it's a little cliche, but I was young-ish. He read it, told me it was a great background, and then completely ignored it during the first and only game. <laughs> that's that's lovely. That's yeah, that's absolute fail. I I have I must admit I have had the absolute fail where I've read a background and went wow this is really cool, and then yeah I did dick with it so it sucks when you when that happens. I think Angela I sh- Angela should hunt them down and stab them. Probably probably they will they will learn. Well, they'll absolutely learn. Keep going. If that first session, uh, in that first session, he opened by announcing that my character's parents had given her a car for her 16th birthday. When I pointed out that this was highly improbable considering what her home life was like, he was surprised and annoyed. Turns out the railroad he had disguised as a game was intended to start with a car chase, so he had to find a way to give my character a car. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just insult to injury. That's a fresh paper cut with lemon juice in it. That's what that is. This background's amazing, Angelo. This thing will be awesome. Hey, guess what happens? This thing is totally against your background. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Game Master. That's not possible. Oh, how dare you? This oh my god, that, this guy's that, awesome. That's just painful uh, to read. Keep going. Unfortunately, that's not the first time I've spent time on a background only to have it ignored. I've seen so many GMs flounder when suddenly their planned scenario doesn't fit the characters the players brought to the game. Sure, sometimes players can ignore the game description the GM gave to them and create a whack ass character. What? But part of the GM's job is to make sure the PCs brought to the table at least stand a chance of working in the game. If you're not going to weave the PCs and their history into the fabric of the game, just go write a damn novel. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm with you. Sure, okay. I do love the Powered by the Apocalypse games because of how they force GMs to at least ask questions of the players and tie them into the world. That particular aspect of those games pretty much sings to me, and I use it in almost every game I run now. As always, great show. Looking forward to episode 100. Thank thank you, Angela. Yeah. That is a piece, as I said in the last episode where we talked about PC questions and stuff, Those I wasn't using 
the bonds mechanic per se, but those types of questions were things that I had started to use myself. And seeing that in the Dungeon World game, I'm like, ah, yes, this is a really cool thing to do. Just again, as she says, the it, it forces the game master to ask those questions because it's part of the game and it's what you need to have in order to uh, build the adventure and build everything else into it. So it's really good stuff. Now, I do think that if you are the, the one thing is about game masters is if they plan too much, that's, I think, a side. I think that's what happens. Like they get too too tunnel vision. So imagine just running a game. With very deli- little yeah, to no tunnels, prep. train, train tunnel. Uh, uh, joke there. That was good. You said tunnel vision, train. Did I just, oh, there you go. You hey. said train. Did you say train? I, I did say train. Oh my god! Damn it. Oh. Okay, I thought you said train. Uh, I kind of uh, did there. Um, but I think if you are a GM and you have you don't prep, like run a game with no prep, like you m- may not have much of a choice then to look at the character backgrounds and incorporate something and let her rip yeah that was actually as i said about random encounters and when i started using uh being more improv and so forth in my game master style when you don't have any prep done the the players have done all this great prep for their characters in some way shape or form so you mind that baby i mean you go out there and you get it you pull it out of them and then start using it right away it's just it's just an awesome awesome thing well angela thank you as always for writing in yes thank you angela so next up is Nicholas Bizak emails us regarding introducing kids to RPGs. Um, this was uh, Chris Angelucci wrote in. Yeah, Chris Angelucci wrote in about this one. That's right. All right. Hey, BSers. Hope you all doing well. Greetings from Texas. All right. We got a man in Tejas. Anyhow, I wanted to write you as one of your recent listeners wrote in about introducing kids to RPGs. Probably like many of us in the hobby now, we started playing in the 80s when we were kids, and now we're all grown up trying to stay active in the hobby while balancing everything else in life and trying to extend our hobby to our own kids if they have some interest. So in my situation, I have a daughter, age 9, who I wanted to try to get started in RPGs. I decided that D&D was too heavy duty for her, so I decided to start with the Marvel Superheroes RPG by Jeff Grubb. That was a fun game back in the day. I had a lot of fun with that. I've played anyway, it once, and it was for, ki- for Kistastrophe. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. The phaser rip system is easy to use, and the, u- and the universal table allows even the kids to understand the game. The reason I started with Marvel was because I could introduce some known elements into the game, like the fact that our own hero was being trained by Captain America. We could role play those training sessions. We had a few sessions, and while her attention span was short, and she had a big desire to adjust the game to her liking and become the GM to tell me what to do, so we had some fun with it. However, after a player. Uh, got her their ass kicked in street combat. She said her player was ashamed of herself and semi-retired her. That led to my next iteration, which was using the universal table and phaser rip rule to create my own RPGs. When the simplicity of those, again, the simplicity of those rules is great. We've done some role-playing with Wizard School, sort of a takeoff on Harry Potter, which has worked out, and we um, also one where we adapted My Little Pony characters into the uh, phaser rip system and put them into our quest. A lot of fun with both of those. My general advice is to keep it as light as possible and to assume your sessions will be fairly short. In my case, one hour max. The last thing I'd like to say is if you want something, quote, off the shelf, unquote, to try Playground Adventures RPG. You can find it on DriveThru. I've heard uh, heard of this game for kids RPG on the Game School podcast, which is run by your buddy, uh, Chad from Dead Game Society. Absolutely. Game School is a hell of a good podcast. Chad and Satine are out there, so that's a good one. Oh, anyway, as he goes on, if your listeners want to know more, they can find that specific episode in that podcast library. Well, that's it for me. Keep up the good work. And if you ever find yourself in Houston, I'll be happy to treat you all to some BBQ or Tex-Mex. Keep up the good work. Neck B. Love me some Texas barbecue, man. Oh, hell yeah. Um, So I do. I do. um, We're going to have an episode on this. Yes. So uh, Chad uh, had Zach S. on game school, and they were talking about the phaser rip Marvel RPG. Oh yeah. Yeah. Zach, I think said that he doesn't use the tables. He's, he uses dice. He's okay. removed the tables and just use the dice system. Cause it does, you can come down to dice. Got it. Anyways, they were explaining what? it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But as Nick points out here, um, one of the things when I play with my son, who's 10, he can, he can game for a couple hours, but Ilana, she's going to be eight this next uh, Saturday. 
when she wants to run a game or play a game, it's a half hour, hour max. And then her attention span is done because she's, she's little, right? And it's a lot of energy and a lot of mental thought and everything that goes into this thing. She wants to play for a bit and then go do something else. Give her some pixie sticks, man. <laughs> no, you do not want my daughter pixie happens. sticks, dude. No, you don't need that. <laughs> you do not want that. I'm going to mess with you guys. This is this is really good stuff, though, Nick. I, I appreciate you writing in about this. So we're definitely going to keep uh, – we have an episode in the hopper. It'll be after episode 100, but it will it will be coming. Next up, sir, is you. Uh, Tom Bagwell. Uh, my pet peeve, I think this is on Google Plus is where he writes this. Yes. Um, my pet peeve has, was always that player who came up with a character that didn't want to join the group and forced me to come up with reasons for him to join. That led to my current practice of having the players come up with the reasons they're all together and how they know each other. Want to, want to be a loner? Fine. Your character is a loner. Now, want to make up make another character who wants to be with the group? These days, I try to have a session before any mechanics are involved where we discuss the issues you mentioned. What are they expecting from the game? What do they want to see? What do they not want to see, etc.? I prefer to do character creation at the table as well to avoid duplication of questions and to discuss any issues that might come up. I know back in the day, um, I had the same problem that Tom did. I would have people make a character, and it was kind of like a challenge. Hey, Brett, I made this guy. He's a loner. He doesn't want anything to do with anybody. Let's see how you work this one. It was like this challenge thing. And I took the challenge at the time. It was not that big a deal. Um, free time was also not such a premium back then. And if somebody had a character that was a challenge, it might take two, three sessions to get them really worked in. That was fine. I played every week, every Saturday. That was totally legit. Now, though, when time is a premium, I would rather, quote unquote, burn the time to have the upfront discussion that Tom talks about and that you and I talked about, Sean. I'd rather have that up front so that so let's look at the Star Wars game. When the Star Wars game you're running wraps up, I'm gonna run a trailer Cthulhu game. So we talked about that as a group as what type of options we had, what we would like to do or not do. It's easier to have that discussion up front and again, quote unquote, burn that time than it is to have everybody just make weird characters or come up with crazy ass shit and then try to challenge the game master us or players to involve that person. That's just a pain in the ass. Yeah, I concur. Sorry, ranting there a bit. Oh, man. It's all good. Players, be good citizens. And the other piece, when you mentioned players, this the request to have the, the session zero, the request to have, doesn't have to come from the game master. Sean and I bag on players all the time, giving, like, giving you guys shit. But if you're out there and you're a player and your game master isn't going to do it, ask, right? If no one else at the table said, hey, can we make characters together? Can we at least have a talk session or something? Um, one of the things I do, again, I talk about my group quite a bit, but my my core gaming group, when we say we're going to make something, they start asking each other questions. What are you thinking about making? What sounds good to you? Hey, what do you want to do? And by doing that, they're having some of that session zero conversation on their own. If your group isn't doing that and you're the player and the game master hasn't pushed it out there yet, pick up that torch and uh, hold it and see if you can get somebody to go for it. There's no reason that you can't do the same thing. Just because the game master hasn't brought it up doesn't mean uh, the players can't start that conversation. Yeah, no, I'm totally on board, dude. I figured you would be. It's it's work for the players, and Sean loves that part. That's true. <laughs> All right. Shall we move on to the topic? I think we shall. All right. Topic O discussion of this week, Brett. Yeah, I want to talk about imprisoning and capturing your characters, not players. That's a different story. Um, <clears throat> but I want to talk about this because one of the somebody was running a game. I can't. I thought you were going to say somebody was going to prison. Someone was going to prison. I was. Yeah, I don't want to. That's, that's a game. different story. I'll tell that off the mic <laughs> some other time. Anyway, so uh, I was <laughs> facing going to prison, and I thought, how the hell do you get out of it? No, the. There is a trope in fantasy or any game, right, where I know – I guess I, I was thinking about this really heavy because my son Connor was playing um, – he, he likes the Skyrim games. He likes those. He was playing the – shit, I can't remember which one comes before Skyrim, but he's playing it on Elder the PC. Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls, thank you. And he's like, you start in prison. He's like, yeah, and then you got to do this thing, and it's this very – you start in prison – 
and you're going to get out. It's very railroady as far as how you get out type of thing. And I thought about it. And I'm like, you know, I have very rarely, if ever, run a – I've captured the characters and imprisoned them and let's see what they do next. That has rarely worked for me. Um, it just – it becomes this weird kind of clunky – you took away my agency. I, you don't have any choice. Oh, great. I have no weapons. I've lost everything. Oh, fine. And it usually ends up in kind of a, uh, a hissy fit. I'm one end of the screen or the other where somebody's really, really pissed off. Oh, actually, I remember where I got this from. I was uh, reading Table Titans by um, the guy who does uh, Player versus Player, Scott. Shit, I can't remember his name. But anyway, TableTitans.com. It's an online uh, co- web comic that he does. And the characters in that in the current uh, storyline, the characters are all captured. And one of the players is like, this is awesome. The background, everything else, but this sucks ass. We're in prison. There's no chance for escape. And the game master looks at him and says, Hey, no, 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 no. I guarantee you, this is not a no win scenario. You can role play your way out of this. What do you want to do? And of course, because it's scripted, everybody sits down, they, they shows the characters thinking, and somebody comes up with this really cool idea. Um, but I'll tell you, man, in the real world of the gaming table, I've rarely seen this work well. So, Sean, have you ever done the whole you start the characters in prison right out of the gate? Have you ever captured in prison or anything like that? Have you have you run into this or have you played it, done it? What? I have done it and I've done it twice. One, I started a Dungeon World campaign as with characters that find themselves in prison. No weapons. Don't know anybody next to them. Um it was kind of a cheesy campy start because they get out of their cells. They sneak around and try to escape pretty easily. And then they enter a big hall where they're confronted with a, a, a kind of the head honcho that gives them an ultimatum that basically says, you know, you've escaped quote unquote. Now I need you to, 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 to do something for me. So how did the players react to that? Because part of me, they were it was it was not it wasn't really a good start to a campaign. If I had looked back, I I, I mean I've admitted that it's not it's kind of stupid in my opinion. And I was running the game. <laughs> I uh, didn't want to say it all out, but that does sound kind of dumb. <laughs> it it was. I, I I had to get them together. I had to get them all together in one central location. And I didn't want it to be an N. And then once they're, I'm like, they're in prison. How are they going to get out? And then once they get out, what are they going to do? So I needed something to drive them in a particular direction. And that's kind of what I came up with on the fly. Like I had no prep at all. Zero, like no, no notes, nothing. I'm like, okay, where am I going to put these guys? Hmm. The better, um, more recent, more apropos situation was when we were running 5e on roll 20. And I think... I think either Jim or Steve joined the party. So one of our players joined kind of in the middle of a short run campaign. And I needed to, and it was, I think it was Jim, Austin, and Steve that showed up for the session. And so what I did was they had something in their history, like, so tying into backgrounds. So somebody in their, somebody in their background had some type of relationship to a dwarf, person or something happened. I, I can't remember. I think one of them was a fight tour. Uh, I don't want to get into, let me tell you about my campaign. But essentially <laughs> what happened was that they were pretty good about it because what I did was I took the campaign and I moved it back five years. Okay. And I started them out being uh, basically enslaved um, through a dwarven sw- slave lord that was in a small town outside of, I don't know, somewhere in the Forgotten Realms, that was known to, it was kind of like Barter Town from Mad Max. Oh, okay. okay. Right? So they always would have the weekly gladiator fight or every two weeks would have a gladi- gla- gladiator fight. So they were enslaved to be put into the pits, the fighting pits. And you know, the owners would make money off of them and people would bet and they were kind of the underdogs. Well, eventually they ended up escaping and, or maybe they didn't, but they would escape eventually. Um, and I, I cut it off. Like they were escaping and the guards were alerted. Two of the folks like Austin and Steve, I think were getting away 
and Jim was starting to get captured. And so I think Steve was going to turn around and try to go back to help him. And then I just stopped the adventure. Okay. And it was huh. done. And then what happened was we, then we, when we started back the, the campaign back up, Steve wasn't in the group yet. His character wasn't in the group or Jim's character. Oh, so it was kind of a flashback. It was a flashback. Okay. And then what it would do is bring this new character into the campaign, into the party current time but it was more coincidence so you guys were going through the lost mine of Fendelver, and there's a part where you're going through this ruin this village of ruins yes yeah, so i remember this now yep yep okay and i yeah. brought that character in and that's how i tied like so the last time i saw you was five years ago you guys got captured it was steve's guy he got he was coming yes. into the party he got captured but nobody knew that's right i got it backwards so jim i think went back to get him and then I cut it. Yes. So Steve was enslaved, quote unquote, or sometime, somehow he negotiated his freedom over time. And then all of a sudden he found you guys or, or it coincidentally kind of followed the story to finding you guys. But Jim and Austin's characters knew Steve's guy from five years ago from the slaver pits Got it. In, okay. being in prison there. So I thought it was kind of a, and I like, yeah, that's how that went. So, so I think the flat, the utility of the flashback that you did there, I think is more helpful. So my main nit or my main complaint about the imprisoned or captured characters is there's basically one goal to get free. And it's usually a foregone conclusion that they're going to get free. Yeah. Um, it's never a well. You're in you're in a work camp, and day one you get the gruel. You fight off two bugbears who try to steal your gruel. Um, the goblin steals your gruel, or you're fighting the. I mean, you, you don't have that problem, or at least you don't want to role play that out. It's like a slog of imprisonment or whatever, because being in prison is sucks. I, I would assume never been myself, but it's bad, and it, it's usually a foregone conclusion that the characters are going to escape. And the only way I have seen players okay, at least the, the ones I have run, that where they're okay with their characters being in prison and not pushing, like, okay, how do we escape? And at some point, some of my players look at me like, look, we're going to get out. Can we just cut to that bit? Can we just get to the fight where we overpower the guards or whatever it is that we have to do to get out of here? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but the only time I've had better luck than that was when they, two times, one, I had players purposely get captured so that they could meet a prisoner and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the individual because that guy had information they wanted. They planned they planned to get arrested, thrown in, and then they had an escape plan. So that was kind of cool. Um, but the other time was when they were captured, and while in there, it was kind of the, oh, shit, I'm totally losing the Count of Monte Cristo uh, type of adventure wall so while imprisoned they encounter an individual who has this great information for them he was old had didn't have the strength to escape himself but he was 99 percent of the way there here's a tunnel here's a thing you can do at this point in time you all can escape um they like that they thought that was interesting because there was <clears throat> excuse me some decent role playing and they got a a clue some great information and something out of it but any other time I've done it or I've seen or heard of it being done, it seems to be you're captured as either like a start to a campaign. Woo, I'm captured. Great. We're going to escape. What happens after we escape? Could we have just started from the, hey, you all just escaped prison. You're running from the guards. Here's a handful of weapons and of various other things you've you've gathered to accouter yourselves with. Good, good luck. Um, but I don't I don't see a lot of fun in the whole captured imprisoned trope well, in most cases. So in the situation that I laid out, Austin, I think Austin was, was pretty flustered. Like, cause I was putting, you know, I was putting the big hammer down. Right. So I had the dwarf and a big, big muscle. So if they didn't want to follow rules, I would, I would put the big hammer down. I'd bring in many guys. They didn't have any weapons or anything. The guards would all be armed. You know, they'd have armor on. So what happens then is the, I guess, to to enforce the feeling of the characters are in prison, you have limited options, you really have to think, whatever it is. The prison can often be synonymous with railroad, speaking of what we were talking about earlier. 
is that the players feel like I can't do anything. I have no agency. If I do this, the guards come and kick my ass. Oh my God. Well, that's kind of what it would be like in a chain gang gladiatorial prison. You know, you, you get lippy. Somebody comes over and busts you in the face. That's kind of what happens. So the thing I, I believe that, that you did well in that session to me anyway, was you moved it fast. It wasn't like a long drawn out half the game session is, you know, lack of combat. Oh, you just, you try this out, oh, you get your shit, you get your shit beat down there. You try this out, you get busted in the face, black guy. Oh Christ. Well, it can be very demoralizing and yeah. super not fun for the players. And I just, like I said, the only times I've had the good luck with it was the whole, they did it on purpose because there was something in prison that they had to get, which was kind of cool. And I, I thought it was a fun challenge for them. And the other time was when I put him in there, but then it was, you know, hey, you meet an old guy who gives you basically huge adventure seeds and a way out the door. Yeah. Well, the adventure, the adventure's purpose was to bring those three characters together in some fashion. That, that and I facilitated it through. Did you tell them that's what you're going to do, or was no, it kind of no? no? Okay, no. So. Kind of so, you know, not to rehash it, but basically, the lost mine of Fandalver, the the party has a tie to a dwarf, and the dwarf either is a friend of the party or a party member, and he hires him to take a slew of goods to Fandolin. That is it. That's like the adventure start, and then that dwarf ends up missing, and it kind of goes off in that direction, right? And then the party runs into a few different things. So we got through the beginning of that, and then Steve wanted to join the party. That's why I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? And there was like, you were gone. I, think, I don't even know if you were part of the party, actually. And then there was a few others that weren't showing up or whatever. So I did that saying like the dwarven slaver knows this other dwarf. So that's kind of the tie to the adventure. Got it. And then those guys, you know... Jim's guy, player, a character, and Austin's player, character, got away, right? So they have that kind of, because they were kind of playing that CD, I got a CD past, right? I've done, you know, bad things. So you gave an opportunity to have bad things. You were in a place because you had done bad things, therefore you met friends, now you're ex-cons because you did time together. Yeah, well, if that's the personality and the background you want, kind of that CD underworld thingy going on, all right, well, I can make that happen, and this is how it happened. And then Steve's guy, I had to put in there as well. So they became associates because they were all, they're all miserable together, right? Misery loves company. They're all yep. kind of banding together. So during the adventure, they were in prison and flustered and they're like, great, wonderful. So, you know, it's like, well, I try to do this. So you get the smack down. Well, I try to do that. I get the smack down. So, but I wouldn't have the adventure all just be that. So they would go, hey, it's fighting time. You know, they send you out into the pits. So then it would be a combat and an encounter that way. And then a key would, you know, somebody would find something shiny in the pits or whatever. Well, I think that one of the things you mentioned there is, is not always getting the smackdown. So you pick on the movie Guardians of the Galaxy. So spoiler, if you haven't seen it, um, all our heroes are in prison. That's where they all meet. They yes. have multiple reasons and issues of why they're there or what they're up to, but they're all in prison. They're all in prison together. And being that they're all the new fish, they're like in a group, whether they like it or not. Then they started countering other people. So this is a high tech, futuristic prison. Chances are the rules are pretty goddamn strict, but there's still plenty of time for them to get out, mill around with players, uh, NPCs, other player characters, ask questions, get interesting information and figure out a way out. So I think so one of the ways that if I was going to go back and make it better when I imprison characters right at the beginning or halfway through an event. Like, oh, this would be cool. Put them in prison and see what they do is instead of in, instead of forcing, just cramming down their throats, the fact that you're in prison every time you do something, there's a guard there to beat your ass. Oh, you can't do that because there's, you know, force shields. You can't get out. You can't do this. It's, it's an ISO cube. Fuck. You're just stuck here forever. Give the players the opportunity to be in general population. Give them the opportunity to talk to people, have interesting NPCs, have stuff for them to do. Even within confines but they can talk to a guy um if, if you make it more shawshank redemption -ish, ish where you meet people you talk to people you figure things out there's more to be done than well we're here all we have to do is figure out how to escape um 
then again, the players will look at you like, well, how come we can't just get to the part where we've escaped? I have give me a random table that says how much gear I stole with me on the way out, how many people we we murdered, and there the guards are chasing us. Well, and so it, I think having more to do than just getting your ass beat is is key. Yeah, I, that's the key, right? You can't just, I mean, unless you're going to run a prison campaign and it's orange is the new black. And mine wasn't necessarily prison prison, right? It was more enslavement and gladiator, 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 gladiatorial, 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 gladiatorial combat, right? Combat. Um, and it, no, the the other piece, the other piece is with slavery is almost oftentimes one just to throw this out there. It can be that topic can be a hot button for certain people. Don't necessarily like dealing with that type of environment. I've I played with certain players that in the past don't like that. They don't like anything that they feel that is one of the most immoral things ever, which is obviously incredibly bad, but they don't like to have that in their adventures at all for whatever reason. So I have found that that is that's been a X card thing for a couple people back in the day. Regardless, though, I think shit. Where am I going with this? The this, the slave the slave concept is even can be worse than prison because you are as such you're less than human. You're less than a normal citizen, and even worse than a criminal, or able to be treated worse than a criminal. So a lot of times, I think again, game masters. Uh, overplay the abuse card. They overplay the domineering component of it. At least I've seen it, and I know I've done it. I know I've done it in the past. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, in the situation that I was running with, it wasn't. Um, I'm not saying you did that. I'm no, just I know, I've but seen I, it, I've seen it done. Yeah, that's certainly one thing you can do. But I was looking at it more of in an arrangement where. Um. You know, you don't have any money. You don't have any kind of future. You've been, you've done some crimes and instead of going to prison, you're going to go off and fight in the pits. The only thing is, is you're not going to have freedom. So it's, it's kind of like a middle ground in this situation. But regardless, you know, you could run, I mean, okay, say your character gets imprisoned for some reason. I mean, you could run a prison campaign. I mean, you could, you know, dip, you know, politicize with the internal groups. You can set up a, you know, a black market ring inside. You could start getting in the favor of prison guards. This actually brings up a, a, a game I had been in before, a traveler game. My buddy Beta was running and we were, we all ended up in prison. And it was a matter of, okay, which prison, because it was nasty sci-fi prison. It was like, okay, which gang are we going to hang out with? Who can we muscle in on, coerce, do something so we could survive? Because holy shit, we're in you know space jail. This is not good. So that the we had multiple sessions in prison, but it was built so that it was essentially like, um, <laughs> kind of like Escape from New York almost in a way, I guess is the best uh, connection I can think of where you have opportunities to walk around, roam around and do things. Granted, you can't leave, but the concept of being in general population, being able to go to this group, talk to them, go to this other group and talk to them. And you had, you had very tight boundaries. Obviously you, you can't leave. You can, and now's the time to go to mess hall. Now's the time to go to exercise. Now's the time to go to the yard, whatever. Um, but you had the opportunity to do stuff other than just try to escape. Even if that was your main goal, we all wanted to get the hell out of there. Because, you know, for um, obviously prison sucks. We all want to get out of there. But there was plenty of good information and cool stuff for us to figure out while we were in there, too. Yeah, I mean. Which, you, which makes it like a small, um, uh, minor city adventure, practically. Right. Yes. But I do, I do sense, I mean, I, I understand the frustration that does come with, I mean, what, what kind of, what's the point if you're going to put the smack down on them every two seconds, they try to do something and then not give them opportunity to do things when they present themselves. I mean, when you go into prison and you have special duty, maybe that allows certain freedoms, right? It's not solitary confinement. Yeah. There's certain conversations to be had. There's people to meet, there's stuff to pass. You can right. Pay someone a pack of cigarettes to get some information, whatever hey, it is you got to do. Maybe there's a prison RPG out there that facilitates all this stuff. There probably is, and I just don't know what it is offhand. I'm positive there is one out there. Um, 
I guess the when I have seen it go bad and more times than not is when it's used as a railroad. You're going to get in and then you're crammed into prison and then you're going to escape. Okay. Again, if that is the only thing that can be done in prison is find a way out. My head tells me that you might, might as well just start on the out. Why fuck about with the inside? You can almost do a um, Dungeon World Bonds thing. Look at everybody. What did you? What horrible, unspeakable thing did you do on your way out of prison? Who did you save on the way out of prison? What did you do that if these other guys outside of uh, that you're all outside of prison with, if they knew about, they would want to kill you? You know, or whatever. You could have that kind of round robin on the table and then say, okay, you're out of prison. Here's a bag of nightsticks, tasers, and some handguns and five rounds of ammo. That's all you got. Go. You're running. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that, again, if the, only, if the only goal is escape and there's nothing else to be gained, part of me says just start out after the escape happened. Don't bother fucking around with the rest of it because there is no – agency there's nothing to be done other than the actual escape and if you know they're going to escape there's no point in rolling the dice there's no point in making the escape seem chancy or whatever it is because if they're going to escape that's the entire purpose well however if they've if they've got the opportunity to role play and stuff within and then try to escape and fail then they go back into solitary for a week and come back out and find out more information and try again if that's the campaign or that's an idea that could be cool but if the whole <laughs> foregone conclusion is they must escape, then just fucking do it. I don't know, man. There may be something to be said about taking one hour out of your session, putting them in prison and making them miserable. Like, I'm, just make you people just make, make the player miserable. character miserable as hell, frustrate the hell out of the player. Because here's my point if it's just kind of a story, which is fine, say you wanted to get them out. And eventually they get out for whatever reason. Maybe it's a technicality. Maybe it's, um, hey, you're on death row. They escort you. I mean, I, I think this is a cool plot. You know, you're in prison. You start out the adventure. You're on death row. You've been on death row for 20 years. And then, you know, you have your last meal. What's your last meal, player? <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. And then uh, you, you dead man walking. You role play it all the way out. You put them in the chair, and then they wake up in another room. And then somebody approaches them and says, here, here's the deal. You know, we're going to give you a second chance. But the reason you make them miserable for an hour is because you say, look, you mess up. And you're, you the, right rest of your, the rest of your campaign is what we just had for the last hour. That's a, that would be a fun cyberpunk game. Sure. That would be a fun unknown armies wackiness. I mean, I could see I mean, shit. I'm, well, this is similar. It almost is the not quite as bad as the bait and switch I did when I was running Delta Green. And I turned everyone into wraiths to play White Wolf Wraith. But, you know, if death is a gateway to the next level of the adventure, you, everyone comes in, they die and then boom, they're ghosts or whatever happens, depending again on the game system you're running. That could be an option or but the, the whole concept of the faked death, you know, um, it was it'd be to wipe out their identity or have them, yep. in, you know, you know, in the they're in the employ of a Remo Williams man. Anybody you see Remo Williams? Oh my god, it's been I think it's, <laughs> I think it's been twenty years. I think it was. It's like Fred Ward, Remo Williams, but which the, is based on the old uh, dime novels type of but thing. But the uh, the thing is, is that you you could have players that are like, why torture them for an hour? Just tell them that's what's going to happen. But I think the thing is, is that some players just kind of hand wave that crap. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. Well, wait a minute. I want to get to the good stuff. Let, it's, you know, you encountered misery. Well, I didn't really, because we just kind of meta plotted it, right? You know, we just meta gamed it. You know, I, yeah, I was in prison. Now I'm out. Now I'm indebted to this, you know, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Well, let's, ref, let's refresh what that really meant. And if it, if it's not like, four or five sessions. If it's not like two, three sessions, right. right? What you're talking about is like, start the game. Yeah. Oh my God, Jesus. Okay. If nothing else, the, the, the unspoken is it's going to get fucking cool. A really crazy ass choice is coming. Something's going to come. It's got to get better. 
it's got to get better. There's no <laughs> way. There's no way this was one hour of, you know, old Sparky, the role playing game. Everybody just gets fried. There's no way this is the game. At some point, something's going to happen. Um, so by doing that in event, you know, OK, it's going to get better. What's happening? And then, again, you can drop a clue. Your your last meal is brought to you and there's a note in it that says, you know, beware. What does that mean? There's a thing in it that says it'll all be OK. You start doing those things and then you you hit them with a couple bits. It still sucks ass because you're on freaking death row, as you said, and you know you're going to die. But you're hoping and you're pretty sure tongue in cheek, nod, wink, nudge, nudge to the game master. Something's going to happen either at this door directly before or after. And then I'll have all this cool thing to do. Dude, yeah, I think you just turn Jason Bourne like right at the end of it. Hey, guess what? You're super ninja, seeker, super spy guy. I think it's a fiasco playset. Hmm. If nobody's written up fiasco playset, on, death row on 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 prison, it should, it should be called the yard. And then it the should yard. be a fiasco playset where you're you got you know your roles are prisoner, guard, warden. You know, you get the relationships. I, I think it would just be hilarious. Obviously, well, think, a little bit more upbeat and Cohen Brothers, mm-hmm. but I think that would be. Yeah, that could be cool. I think the what we're talking about here at the end of it is that the. To me, when I hear about it, the, the trope that comes to my mind is this stupid slog of, OK, <sighs> I'm in prison. I'm going to escape. No, you're Fine. not. Tell, tell me how many hit points I've lost and I'm out. Because that's how it usually is thought of, or at least the, the way I think about it. If you do it with opportunities to role play, you do it like we just outlined there. Or when you, when the players are like, oh my, I can't do anything I'm in prison. I can't do anything I'm in prison. What kind of skills do you have? Oh yeah, I've got fast talk of like 98%. Dude, start fast talking the guards, start moving. Oh yeah, shit, I guess I can do that. Um, sometimes the the other cool piece can be when you strip the players of gear you strip them of spells you strip them of that stuff and they're down to the basics of their character sheet you know physical attributes assuming a character has physical attributes in the game and skills that's what you've got what can you do with that then obviously they have to have ways to use it that can to get them what they need so if they're trying to barter stuff in prison they've got fast talk next thing you know they got a carton of cigarettes next thing you know they got a cell phone they've got this they've got that um there's ways to there's ways to make it interesting, you know, other than just throw them down, beat them down, and then have the inevitable escape. It's a powered by the apocalypse game right there. Like you could you could feed off the you know, your your prisoner and if you're face face person prisoner, charismatic person, right? Like yeah, a leader of man. yeah, face man, mobster person, right? Maybe they're not muscle like they're not going to beat the crap out of everybody they have but they're going to get along with a bunch of people relationship wise yeah but, he's got all those he pulls all the strings he knows everybody he knows a guard's wife he's yep. got all this stuff but yeah. you but you tie all the you tie everything to the outside world and what's and how you're manipulating the outside world yes. as well as the inside so as you're yeah. getting as you're getting things done on the outside how does that provide boons to you on the inside so if you're like hey want to move drugs and you're watch, Sons of, watch Sons of Anarchy, watch any prison yeah. show where somebody or shit, people in the real world have done things for people in prison. Guys in prison have ordered hits outside of prison because right. the leader of this gang is in jail. He or she doesn't care. They still order the thing because everybody listens to them. They order the hit and they're already in jail. You know, <laughs> this shit happens. People get drugs in the jail. People smuggle all sorts of stuff. There's things that can, I guess there's better ways to do it. And a lot of times... I know um, player agency is, is a big thing, and a lot of times when people see that they're imprisoned and they feel like they have no agency, they feel like there's nothing they can do. What we've outlined here, though, is you there's ways to do that within the confines of prison, even if the end of it is essentially a foregone conclusion that they're going to escape or things will get better or things will change. Well, guess what? Every role-playing game, things will change, things will get better or worse or whatever happens. It's just the confines in which you choose to play it in. So if it's a stop along the way 
to defeating the Dragon King of Korgoth, then fine, you're going to you're going to find out something has to be figured out in here and there has to be opportunity for the players to do something. I guess my warning is that don't as the game master, don't amp don't overly lean on the whole depression you can't do that no 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 you know the nightsticks just whomping the shit out of the player characters if you lean on that too heavy you'll have a rebellion on your hands the players won't want to deal with it unlike sean sean doesn't give a shit so i'm gonna run i'm gonna run a, a pr- i'm gonna run a game that's uh you're all prisoners in a prison and then just whoop on <laughs> whoop on the player characters the entire four hours you're lying to get food they they serve grits you don't like grits oh i hate grits guard hears you hits you in the kidneys with a nightstick oh boom I, you don't like grits boy wham 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 <laughs> jesus christ i really? sincerely believe if I run any campaign that will get me physically beat up, it would be one, that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, I'd pay. I would. We could get that in like a theater, an amphitheater. We could get guys with popcorn just to see how long it takes. Like or how totally. long? Yeah, how long would it take for people to just get up, walk off, or or throw or their character assault, <laughs> or physically assault me? Like, oh man, the longest I've ever gone is two hours. They put up with two hours of bullshit. Wow. <laughs> Oh. And that'd be nasty. Yeah. I, I guess if now, again, we we say this every episode, but somebody out there I'm certain has done this and had good success with it, had horrible, had horror stories with it, whatever. I really think the, the concept of being captured, imprisoned, that slavery, whatever it is, it immediately tells the player that I have no agency. I, I can't do anything. I'm stuck. It sometimes takes a little out of character discussion, or if you don't have the mechanics to do it, it can take something to help push them a little bit. Say, no, there's options. It's okay. There's answers to be found here. The message of hey, there, there's still hope comes in. You know, your mashed peas or whatever it is you're served. Um, some guard starts treating you favorably. You don't know why. Come to find out, he knows your sister because I'm paying attention to your character background. Whatever the case is, there's ways to help lift the <laughs> lift the player spirits while the characters are in prison. There's ways to do that and get them to see that there are role-playing opportunities, there's skill use opportunities. Sure, they don't have their magic spells, you know, AR-15s and uh, stun grenades, but there's plenty of cool stuff to do. So they can get, yeah, sure, again, foregone conclusion, maybe escape, but maybe they're within prison and they have to figure out a way to protect their loved ones outside of prison. How are they going to do that? What, well, how is this going to work? So there's there's ways to make it cool, as long as the the characters and players, especially the players, believe that what they do isn't every time they turn around, they're not just going to get a tased zap. That's it. Sorry. You know, fire hose. That's it. Hey, I, that could be the least of their problems. Yeah, it could be. That could, could be, be like prison could be. Could be stabbed. <laughs> hey, three, three hots and a cot, man. Yeah. You go true. outside into the big broad world where people want to kill you. Maybe you're wanted out there. Maybe you got everybody in the world hunting hunting you down. They don't want you in prison. They want you dead. But in prison, eh, you're kind of you're almost safe, almost. Almost. It depends on well, who you surround it, yourself with. Yeah. What does it take to get in the solitaire? What does it take to get in solitaire? <laughs> I got to get in solitaire. <laughs> got to put your guard. I accidentally lipped off. I got to get in solitaire. <laughs> All right. Cool. Anything else, man? No. All right, let's move it on. Die roll it. I roll. Segment in the show where we point out two to four miscellaneous points of gaming or geekery we want to share with you. Brett has two, I've got two, and we've got three from you, the Our listener. listener. Yeah. So the first one is there is a Washington Post article where a burglar headline burglary suspect kept stolen brain beneath porch and used oh, it to get high. I saw that. When police showed up at a vacant trailer home in Penn Township. Neighbor Pat Beck was worried something might be wrong. <laughs> Apparently, he had a brain, a human brain inside a box. <laughs> so, as you, as, as you, hey, as you do. Yeah, what? And where else would you keep your human brain? Right? Is he in Wisconsin? No, I don't think so. We've got, got, we've got some. Yeah, we got some dandies. We've some, yeah, we've had some winners. No, this is in uh, Pennsylvania, from the looks of it. I see. Hey, Pen- it. hey, Pennsylvania, represent. <laughs> exactly. You got your crazies. Anyway, this is the type of thing, because we're gamers, I read this and go, okay, this is a Cthulhu plot. This is uh, something. This is easily usable in any any horror game. Somebody's doing a thing, and uh, yeah, this is cool to do. So when you Nobody use knows. it, and when you use it, I'll be like, 
Oh, really original, Brett. Like, original just take Brett. it right off the headlines. Just put me in prison and beat me down. Jesus, <laughs> just as good as that. <laughs> Some guy eating brains, getting high, thinking he's going to yeah. eat brains and get high. Uh, whatever, man. Uh, the other one is their uh, Snow Ghost. It's a haunting images of derelict Soviet infrastructure. I think people have seen these out there before, but um, there's a number of different um, – Boats, buildings, and all, all sorts of different things that are out there, uh, all taken during winter in 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 Soviet Russia. There's different components of it, and I love these images. Some of them have almost like a spaceship quality to it. If you're doing a post-apocalyptic type of thing, or anything like that, I think it's the the imagery itself can be very helpful. You see this um, flashing into the players type of thing. I think it can be pretty damn handy. So there you go. Link in the show notes, of course. Sean, over to you, sir. Uh, fantasy flight game, Star Wars, vir- virtual tabletop token set. So you go to this website, you click on the link, and then you can select the different types of tokens you need, and it filters them down. So if you need, like, Stormtroopers, you click the Stormtroopers tag, and then it just, like, brings those up. So really good if you're running um, virtual tabletop and you need some decent made tokens, and they're all free, so... I, I forgot who to cool. give credit to, but it, a link in the show notes. Yeah, there's the Duros, Humans, Dugs, Accolades. Wow, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Nice set. Ghostbusters RPG by West End Games is out on the internets for free. Free. Really? Yeah, for free. Is that really? For Holy crap. Free. There's Holy like 10, 10 PDFs, I think. Damn. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, I know Phil was looking for a copy of this. <laughs> He's got one, but he bought it. Yeah. Well, I mean. Maui can have a PDF version. Now you get a PDF and you go do a print on demand somewhere and get yourself a nice copy of it. Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. Kind of cool. So lovers of the old makers of paranoia. From the makers of paranoia, Ghostbusters, the RPG. Nice. Cool. So we got a couple from listeners. Pure Mongrel, our uh, brother from down under, our Australian. Um, He has got us a link here to evidence that the U.S. has deep space warships. Well, yeah. No shit. NASA hacker. I found evidence. Yeah. Article out there about this stuff. This is, I love conspiracy stuff like this. There's so much cool shit. All you have to do with a conspiracy story like this is just say, I wonder if that was true. Hey, you know what? I'm running a game. This shit's true. That's not conspiracy, Boom. man. That's out of Area 51, brother. Of course it is. Yep. Uh, Eugene uh, Fanzano has, tells us about his horror RPG, Grin. We've got a link in the show notes out to his game, Grin, by uh, Arcadia Games. Grin is a game of survival horror. Uses a rules light uh, role-playing system that fits on a single page. Use standard deck of playing cards as core resolution mechanic. No dice needed. Fast Deadly Grin is perfect for high mortality single session games or one shots. This looks like a pretty damn cool thing. And he's looking at, it's a pay what you want. Average contribution is about two bucks. People are throwing his way. Um, I think it's definitely worth uh, worth a look. So give uh, one of our listeners some love and take a look at what he's built with Grin. Last is Joe Fitz. Uh, has a link out there for virtual battle maps. Build and export uh, print and web quality battle maps. So link out there, steampower.com, um, to what he has out there. It looks pretty darn cool. It's map creation, 3D to print. It's pretty It's pretty cool stuff. Some of those, this is super visual, so I'm not going to go crazy describing here, but just uh, go out there, take a look, and thank you, Mr. Fitz, for pointing that to us. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Otherwise. I think that I think that was a show, man. That is the show. What are we talking about next week, Brett? Well, next week we're going to talk about making mistakes and why it's okay. It's okay to do that. What? Making mistakes? No, I I, I'm off that week, I guess. I guess you are. <laughs> it's the solo show. The <laughs> solo show. Gaming and B. Uh, yeah, it'll be Brett's confessional. Here's the thing I did. I tried this and fucking blew up. <laughs> really sorry. If anyone's listening and ever played in that game, I'm sorry right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna talk about making mistakes, uh, either in front, behind the screen, that type of thing, and oh. why it's a good thing. So, we touched on it in an earlier episode, but we're gonna bring it back. Sounds like a learning opportunity, Brett. It might be a learning opportunity. You never know. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in. 
if you uh, if you appreciate this show, do us a f- now do this a favor. Tell somebody. Tell Absolutely. somebody and have them subscribe. They don't Throw like it. Out. Yeah. They can stop listening. They can stop <laughs> listening. That's cool. But remember, just remember, if they're going to get in it they, and they come in the, this episode right now, they'll be like, man, if only I understood the deep, resonating backstory. Start at one. That's right. Work your way forward. That's the only way to go. Yeah. That's it. Awesome. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night. Good game and all. This episode of Gaming and BS brought to you by patrons like Jeff Rademacher, Christian Sexy Voice Serrano, Kevin Lovecraft, Joe Swick, Brett's Biggest Fan, Steve Day, Old School DM, Forrest Aguirre, Tony Baker, Mark Anthony Benedetti, Palladian, Bruce Cunnington, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Misdirected Mark Productions, Sean Nicholson, Tim Jensen, Chris Steele, Knights of the Night Crew, Jason the Blair- Beard, Blaylock, Remy Billado, Jason Hobbs Hobbs, Mark Tasaka, Mirko Froehlich, Wayne Humphrey, James Carpio, and Pure Mongrel. Consider becoming a patron. For the cost of a coffee shop coffee, you can support the show for an entire month. Whoa. Stop recording.